So now we're going to talk about some optional hardware, things you don't necessarily need, but it'd be really, really good to have. And the first one of those tools is the jointer. So I'll show you a clip of what that jointer looks like. I've done a couple of YouTube videos on them. And uh, really, when you need one, is we're going to be talking about the jointer, the planer, and uh, the dovetail jig. So if you're going to be buying, we'll get into where we get our lumber from uh, later on, but you have re really two choices. You can buy a lumber from a hardware store that's already ready to go for you. It's been planed, it's been jointed, it's been sanded, or you have rough cut lumber from a lumber yard. So it depends on what wood you're using. So if you, uh, and we, again, we'll get into, we'll do a whole lesson on this, but if you want to take rough cut lumber from a lumber yard and you want to build your cabinet out of that, you really need a joiner, or at least need access to a joiner. And what a joiner does is just this blade, it's a, a level table, it's dead level, and it's got a blade across it. And the one, one outfeed table, the one side of this table is set a little higher, it's actually set to the le level of the rotating blade, and the infield table is set a little lower. And when you run your board across that, it actually squares, it completely squares off the bottom of that uh, board. So, you know, you absolutely need it for certain projects. If you're going to be working with some kind of store-bought material, you, need, you definitely need it less, but it's a good tool to have access to, especially if you want to do rough cut. You cannot do rough cut, taking rough cut wood and build cabinets or build built-ins or anything out of it unless you have access to a joiner. All right, you, so you can put clean, crisp edges on them on, if you stand them up on their side, if you run the, the, the board on, on its bottom and clean up its bottom and square it to the fence, you need the joiner. So um, there's a couple ways you could build cabinets and not use them even without the lumber. Um, but you, if you want to be versatile and, and be able to do all that stuff, a joiner is good to have. Uh, I bought one on Craigslist for like 200 bucks, maybe 150. Uh, brand new, they are expensive. They are several hundred dollars. They're going to cost you almost as much as your table saw. Um, you know, it, it's really something you got to figure out. The first thing I do before I determine if you're going to buy a joiner is figure out, and we'll get into this, uh, what you, cabinets you're going to build, what they're going to look like, what features they're going to have. And then you also have to figure out where you're getting your lumber from. And, and that determines what, what you, that's really going to determine everything, what tools you're going to use it during what parts of the steps and the build process and all that. So um, you don't run out and get one unless you're going to be hardcore into woodworking, because if you are, you need one for that too. But uh, it's really, a, what are you doing? What are you building? What type of cabinets? What style? What are your sizes of your wood and all that stuff? And at some point, you may you just may need to get one. Um, but I would look on Craigslist for one of those because, you know, they're expensive. The next optional piece of power tooling you may want to consider buying is a thickness planer. And a thickness planer, and I'll show you what that looks like there. I've, I've used this much more often than the joiner. A thickness planer will, again, take that rough lumber after you've passed it through the joiner a couple times and you've cleaned one of the surfaces up and it's square and you've cleaned up one of the edges and it's square, you can reduce the thickness by running that board through a thickness planer. And it gets you that perfectly uh, three quarter inch thick board that's almost like buying it from the store, but it's better because it's freshly done. This, the, the wood has just left your, your tools. It's just gone over the joiner. It's just gone through the thickness planer. It hasn't been sitting up, leaning against a wall at a hardware store for weeks on end. It has, it's not going to develop a cup because you're going to do all that work to it and you're going to use it right away. If you were to do all that work and then lean it against your garage wall for four months, you're basically wasting your time. So um, again, this is more of a rough lumber tool. I also use my thickness planer for cleaning up the edge of, of work pieces. So if I take a two inch wide board, or let's say we buy a piece of poplar from one of the hardware stores, and it's a, let's say a one by four. So that's, you know, three quarter inch by three and a half inches. And I want to make that board two inches. Well, I'd run it down maybe two and an eighth of an inch. And, I'd, and then that one edge you just ran over the saw blade is going to have a, a rough surface to it. It's not going to be a finished factory edge anymore because that table saw, that's just not what it does. It leaves a, a rough trace. Uh, so what I would do is I could take that board, stand it on, on its clean edge down, and run that rough cut part on, on facing up through the, through, through the thickness planer. And that thickness planer has rotating blades, and it just takes off and puts the factory edge on that up-facing surface. So uh, you could basically resize your board widths and put a new factory edge on there down to whatever dimension you want using the thickness planer. So again, it works on edge 
or on flat, on his, on his back or his top. Um, they tend to be limited in their width. So mine's like a 12 inch thickness planer, um, which you wouldn't be doing wide widths anyway. We're typically talking one or two boards here, small three and four inches, that kind of thing. Um, they are heavy and they aren't cheap. They're definitely cheaper than a joiner. I think I got mine used for like a hundred bucks. That's another great thing. You could just pick up used on Craigslist or something. I've got a DeWalt. Uh, it works great. And it's, it, again, it, it's part of a complete cabinet shop. Get it. But uh, if, if, you, if we plan, if you plan your build around not using that, those equipment, then you, you can get away without it. But it, if, it, it's definitely a nice to have. There's a, a good finishing tool I would recommend you, you pick up if you want to. It really depends on how you d plan on finishing your cabinet. So when the cabinets are all built, they're all sanded, you have the option of, of staining it and applying polyurethane or priming it and painting it. And if you go the, the priming and painting route, having a sprayer works really well. Um, sprayers come in either an HVLP uh, high volume, low pressure, which, you know, uh, it's the kind of the ones you see in car shops. It's got the can above it, below it, or the one above it. And it shoots a very fine mist of, of highly atomized uh, paint, and it gives you a nice even coat. So almost all of your cabinet shops, professionally, if you go to a cabinet vendor or a supplier, all their stuff has either been stained, uh, stained by hand, or and then polyed with, with a gun, they actually spray the polyurethane as opposed to like brushing it on. Um, you can kind of control the amount. You can do s a, several s very light coats and get a nice even finish. Um, so you can do that either with the, the primer or the paint. Uh, so if, if you're gonna, for instance, paint your cabinets white, I would spray two coats of a high quality primer and then spray two coats or three coats of a nice finish, a uh, lacquer or an enamel, um, and you'll get the nice hard coating on there. Uh, you could brush it if you want to, uh, but the more you brush, even if you use a good leveling paint, like an enamel, like a satin Pervo or a Sherman Williams Pro Classic, you still get a little bit of brush marks. And that's fine if you want that look. If you want a perfectly smooth look, like so you just walked out of Ikea with this and it's got a candy coating on it and it's, it's just flat and gorgeous um, and perfectly smooth, then you're going to want to you want a spray gun at that point. Uh, you can use spray cans if you're building a cabinet. If you're building 10, 15 cabinets, that's just not practical. So uh, they're fairly inexpensive. Um, you can use HVLP guns with a turbine unit, and it's a little box, and they're several hundred dollars. If, if you're gonna be doing this a lot, go get it. But uh, Fuji Mix, uh, the Mini Mite 3 and Mini Mite 4, I think they're called. Uh, I have a turbine unit, and the turbine units come in this little box, the, the actual air supply part comes in a little container and uh, feeds out a hose to your sprayer, as opposed to buying a large compressor. So uh, if you want to um, have one big compressor, like the thing I bought that, I think it was $150, I bought that used, um, that'll, that'll spray paint fine. Uh, the small pancake ones that we use in the brad nails and stuff, you, you really can't spray paint with them. They just, they don't, they'll have to keep recharging. They need a constant stream of, of even air when you're painting, otherwise it's not gonna work. So either a turbine or a large compressor. Uh, the other option you have, I've seen people do this, I've never done it, is use an airless sprayer. So an airless sprayer um, has an air supply unit and it's really designed for spraying walls and ceilings, um, and it puts out a lot of paint, a good amount of latex paint. Uh, and, you know, I, I've never seen professional hardcore cabinet manufacturers or, or cap carpenters use it, um, but I've seen people online use it, and they seem to like the results, but uh, it does put out a lot of paint. Like, really, that's why you put it on the wall. If you try to spray your walls and your baseboards with an HVLP gun, it's going to take you all day. You know, you have to do seven, six, you know, just coat after coat after coat. An arrow sprayer, boom, 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 you're done. Like two coats and you're good. So it's, that's the whole thing on, on, on sprayers is you either go the airless route and try that and see if people online have done that. I'm not going to do that. I do have an airless sprayer, but I, I, I'm using it for walls and ceilings and that sort of thing. Uh, or to go the HVLP route, which is what I'll demonstrate when we do it. And the HVLP, you can spray lacquer, you can spray shellac, you can spray polyurethane. Um, I'll probably still stain it by hand. I don't know if people stain with an HVLP gun. I think you can, but usually you're wiping on the stain and then wiping it off or, or applying the stain and leaving it. Um, the nice thing about spraying polyurethane is, especially if you want a nice, deep, thick 
stained look to it, right? This deep, thick color. Um, and then you go to apply your polyurethane with like a foam brush. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it hasn't been, the stain hasn't been wiped off properly or it's still kind of on there pretty thick, that polyurethane will, will wipe some of the stain off with it. And then all that work you did to kind of get that, that really dark colors kind of smears out. So having a spray of polyurethane on it locks that stain on there and um, you don't get any marks. So you could always just spray a couple coats of shellac or, or polyurethane on your workpiece uh, and then brush on a couple of polyurethane pieces, a couple of coats of polyurethane. You don't have to worry about the stain running or, or getting blotchy. Um, but that's how you do that. So that's a sprayer is, is one of those things. You just want that perfectly clean, even coat. So something to think about. So the last piece of optional hardware we're going to consider is the dovetail jig. So you would use a dovetail jig to put on a dovetail joint on certain parts of your cabinet. And we're really just talking about the boxes of the drawers. So on higher end kitchens and you pull out that drawer and you see on the side there, uh, the higher end kitchens will have a very well-defined dovetail joint. So it looks very, very nice, but it's also a very, very strong joint. Um, do you need to do that? Depends what you want to do. If you want to have a, a dovetail joint, um, great. Uh, I, Maybe we probably, we're probably going to do one in the course of this build, actually. Uh, you don't have to do dovetail joints. If you, if you just want to throw up some kitchen cabinets and, and have them look really good, you don't need to do that. Uh, but if you want to, you have a couple options. Number one, you can buy a jig, a dovetail jig. And uh, I'm probably going to pick one up for this course and, and use it and build one. You also need a dovetail um, router bit, okay, that goes along with that uh, jig. Um, the other option you have is actually just buying the drawer boxes online. Again, we'll get into that when we get the drawers, but um, there are websites online. You can order pre-made, pre-dovetailed boxes and you get them home and um, you put them together with a little glue and boom, they're done. So if, if you still want that high-end look, but you don't want the hassle of having to go through building drawers and all that stuff, um, you could just buy them. It's a few hundred dollars to do that. And again, when we get to the drawer section of this course, uh, we'll show you how to do that. Um, but, you know, do you want to buy a jig? If you're going to be doing a lot of kitchens, uh, not just your own, then I, my recommendation would be probably pick one up. Uh, but you can always outsource that stuff. So it's just, what do you want to do? Is it another thing, another process you don't want to learn, another tool you're going to use once? Mm, maybe it'd be better to buy them online or just use a regular dado groove joint and not a a dovetail. Uh, but that's your call. Uh, it's up to you and your budget and what you want to do.